Welcome, Tamara. She comes and receives from what she has for us today. God bless you, Tamara. Good morning, church. How are we? <laughs> yeah, as Pastor Russell said, I'm married to Benjamin, who you've probably seen around. He's up here often, hosting, preaching, doing sound things. You've probably seen him quite a bit, but I like to think I'm his better half. He had to go do something out there so I can say that while he's not in the room. <laughs> Obviously, I'm joking, but I did say to him this morning, wow, what a privilege it must be for you to drive the guest speaker today. <laughs> he could have cleaned the car first, though. He didn't. No, it's a real privilege to be with you this morning as we continue our series on strong bonds. And if you haven't been here with us so far for this series, uh, it is not a series about underwear, as Pastor Russell keeps assuring us, right? But it's a series about our relationships within our church, the unity within our church. Our core scripture for this series is Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, and they'll pop it up on the screen for us, thank you, which says, as a prisoner of the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through this bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. And because we want to be this unified church that the Bible speaks of, we've been running this series around those four qualities that Paul calls out, right? Be humble, gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. And these qualities, they're going to be beneficial to you in your life, right? They're going to help you in your work, your families, your marriages, your parenting, your relationships. But more than that, these are the qualities that are going to keep us together through the bond of peace and show the world through our unity that God is God. Amen? So in terms of a super speedy recap of where we've been so far, Pastor Russ opened the series and he taught about what Christian unity is and he kind of recapped that a bit today, right? That our commonality comes before our difference, but it's not about uniformity, it's about unity. And then Ben came and spoke about humility and he taught us that it's about getting along and getting aligned with God. It's about lowering ourselves, not about lowering others, it's about lowering ourselves and comparing ourselves to God and not others. Then Pastor Russell spoke last week around gentleness and he taught us that gentleness is strength under control. So gentleness is not weakness. By definition, you've got to be strong first to keep it under control. And it is my complete privilege to come and speak today on the topic of patience. Patience. <laughs> To which I first said, nope, <laughs> I don't want to preach on patience. If I preach on patience, God will surely give me a lesson in patience. And you know what that looks like, don't you? Yeah. No, I was, of course, joking. It's a complete honor and privilege to come and share around patience this morning. Let's pray, and then we'll jump into it, yeah? Father, we just thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that it is a guide for us um, to live our lives well, and that it gives us guidance to be your church, Father, and how to be your church. This morning, we just open our hearts, we open our minds, Lord. We thank you that you meet us where we're at, and we just open ourselves to be um, challenged this morning and to grow this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, patience. Something we kind of expect from everybody else, but it's a bit hard to give out, isn't it? When I first thought about patience, the first thought that came to my mind was this woman. This is my beautiful mother, um, angel of a woman. <laughs> Most of her life, she was a stay-at-home mom and raised five kids, like, what a hero. But my mother, to me, has been and, and still is the picture of patience. And I remember my mom often said to me growing up, patience is a virtue, my dear. 
Like, what does that even mean, a virtue? And as a typical teenager, I would, you know, roll my eyes <laughs> and continue being impatient. But clearly she said it to me enough times because that is ingrained in my mind. I hear her voice all the time. Patience is a virtue, my dear. <laughs> my next major lesson in patience came when I moved in with this guy. <laughs> now, you know him as, you know, organized, calm, Pastor Ben, but do you know what it is like to live with him? <laughs> He's good at everything except putting away his clothes and his tissues. <laughs> I'm sharing secrets this morning. Look, I'm mostly joking. He's actually amazing. But for me, moving in with a boy was weird. And it took some big lessons in patience, which I often failed. And he was mostly kind and patient with me as I worked through that. But to date, my ultimate lesson in patience so far has by far been these three. <laughs> These are our three kids, Leon in the middle, Zara, Memphis, and I absolutely adore being their mum. I absolutely love it. But nothing really prepared me, or even still prepares me today, to the incessant, mum, 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 mum. And it seems like they all do it at the same time. So it's like, mum, 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 mum. And my favorite, you know, it's when they turn this three-letter word into this 15-letter word, right? And it's like, mom. <laughs> and it seems like they never come to me and say, hey, mom. It's like wherever they are in the house, it's like, mom. And they're just beckoning you over. <laughs> Let's just say it's an ongoing lesson of patience for me, right? There is nothing like taking three small children grocery shopping that's going to test your patience. But these were the things that sprang to my mind when I first thought about patience, right? I thought about that feeling of frustration, of waiting, of slowness, right? And I have no doubt that you've had similar experiences in this room because our world is becoming more digital, faster, more instant, and in general, our world is described as becoming more impatient. They actually call us the instant generation, right? The fast food, fast media, fast responses kind of generation. And this has kind of created this expectation in us of more for less or more in less time, hasn't it? And when that expectation isn't met, we see the fruit of our hearts, don't we? Have you ever found yourself questioning why someone hasn't responded to your message yet? <laughs> like seriously, why do they even have a mobile phone? Let's just send them back to the dark ages of landlines and snail mail, right? <laughs> maybe that's not you, but maybe you found yourself feeling frustrated when someone's driving too slowly, AKA right on the speed limit in the fast lane. Like how dare they obey the law in this lane when I'm late, right? Well, what about at the supermarket and there's long lines at the checkout, you've got a couple of things and you're heading towards the back of that line and someone scoots right in front of you with a full trolley you are gonna have to wait an extra five, 10 minutes? Like, did they not see you going towards the end of that line? <laughs> right, I'm obviously being a little jovial here, but these are just some common examples where our, testi our, testins, our patients may be tested on a regular basis. You may even feel like you've been wronged in some of those instances. You may even be tempted to lash out in some of those instances. Like when that person didn't reply to you, do they not deem you important enough to respond to your message? Maybe you've decided, I'm not even gonna bother with them anymore. That's what they get. Or when that person was driving too slow 
in the fast lane and they forced you to go slower than you wanted to. Maybe then you're tempted to just tailgate a little bit, just a little bit of roadside bullying. Or maybe you'll aggressively undertake and do one of these ones, right, as you go around and you just really make sure they know as you go around, you're just looking at them, aren't you? Or when that person pulls in front of you in the supermarket, I don't even know what you might be tempted to do. Hey, Pastor Russell, just make sure that express lane light is not on. Yeah, yeah. Ask Pastor Russell about that one later. (laughs) But these are just some examples when your patience may have been tested. You may feel that you've been wronged in some way. You may be tempted to lash out. And I can just hear my mother saying, patience is a virtue, my dear. Like, deep breaths. (laughs) You're kind of feeling a little bit frustrated just thinking about these things as you talk about them. You see, there's a patience that's about waiting through a process. Like when you sow a seed and you have to wait for it to grow. When people are learning and growing, it just takes time and you just have to wait it out. But then there is this whole other level of patience that's called upon when we feel like we've been wronged. And this is the patience that Ephesians 4.2 calls us to as believers. The word patience in Ephesians 4.2 is the Greek word macrothumia, which means waiting sufficient time before expressing anger. This avoids premature use of force or retribution that rises out of improper anger. It's a personal reaction. This word, macrothumia, is considered interchangeable between patience and long-suffering. And it is the self-restraint which does not hastily retaliate a wrong. Last week, Pastor Russell said that these four qualities in Ephesians, right, the the, um, humility, gentleness, patience, and bearing with one another, they kind of tend to flow together. And one of the commentaries I read, it said exactly that. It said that meekness or gentleness is a natural fruit of humility. And it said that this form of patience, macrothumia, is the manifestation of such meekness with something of a special effort and struggle in the bearing of injury. So if meekness or gentleness is that strength under control, like Pastor Russell taught us, then patience is strength under control with exceptional effort and struggle when you've been wronged. Keeping that strength under control despite feeling like someone deserves to feel the weight of that strength. Have you been wronged like that before? Have you had that feeling where, you know, they they deserve it. They deserve it. I know I have. Are you getting this picture of what macrothumia is? If we had an English adjective that was long-tempered instead of short-tempered, right, that would describe macrothumia. It's not just the process of waiting, but waiting sufficient time before expressing anger, particularly when you've been wronged. This type of patience is described of God himself in 1 Peter 3.20. It describes how God patiently waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. And if you know your Bible, then you know how that story goes, right? God then sends this massive flood that wipes out the whole earth. Every creature, every human, he wipes out the whole earth, except for Noah and his family and two of every kind of animal that are on the ark. And then he promises never to do that again. But the Bible says that he waited sufficient time before expressing that anger. He patiently waited while the ark was being built. And God's quality of this patience, this macrothumia, is described again in 2 Peter 3.15, which says, bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. It's God's patience that allows us to have salvation. He waits sufficient time, and in doing so, he gives us time to repent, to come to him and find salvation. Like, 
I'm, I'm really glad that God waits sufficient time for us, aren't you? And shouldn't we as believers want the same for others? Right? We don't offer salvation. But when we don't have macrothumia, right, this type of patience, what does it have potential to do to someone's faith? To their journey with God, their journey of salvation that they're outworking in the church, right? The church exists for people to find God and outwork that, that salvation and that journey to outwork their faith in community. And when we don't have this type of patience, do we rob them of that opportunity? So macrothumia, <laughs> patience, it's pretty important for us as believers within the church. It contributes to our bonds of peace and it allows people to outwork their faith journey. But you might be sitting here and thinking, how does patience keep the bond of peace? How does it do that? How does it give us strong bonds? You see, what it does is it allows space for our bonds to bend but not break. It gives allocation for each other to grow. One moment, my screen's just gone funny. It gives allocation for each other to grow and to repent, right? Like God does for us. It makes room for storms to inevitably come among us and for us to bend and not break. Just like a palm tree does in a storm, it bends but doesn't break. I introduced you to my mum before and my mum, obviously with my dad, gave me my name Tamara, which actually means palm tree. <laughs> Growing up, I used to be pretty jealous of my siblings. There's a few of them, but there's, there's Nicholas, which meant victory of the people. And then there was Cassandra, which meant shining upon man. There was Rebecca, which meant captivating beauty. And then there was me, palm tree. <laughs> right? Like, thanks, mum and dad. <laughs> But my beautiful, patient, sweet mother, she would always say to me, Tamara, palm trees are amazing. She would tell me that when storms come, many trees are broken or completely ripped out of the ground. But a palm tree has the ability to bend and not break and bounce back when the storm has passed. You see, strong bonds are not immovable bonds. Strong bonds are flexible bonds. Even the tallest buildings, the skyscrapers that we admire for their strength have an allocation to sway and to flex so they don't break. And within the church, this is what patience does for us. It creates strength in our bonds through flexibility for one another. It makes room for the storms to come amongst us and for our bonds to bend but not break. I, um, I always admired how Ben's dad practically outworked this with us when we were dating. When we were dating, Ben had a curfew of 11 p.m. Now, not 11.01, 11 p.m. And I'll admit, there were times when we were late. Ben was late. <laughs> there were times when Ben was late, but whether that was... I don't know. It was his fault, let's face it. Um, <laughs> there were times when he was late, and Ben would tell me that when he got home, he'd already have received messages from his dad and such, but when he got home, his dad would be waiting in the window, but by the time he got out of the car and inside the house, his dad was gone and back in bed, and he wouldn't address the issue until, like, the next day or the next opportunity. And in doing so, he kind of allowed himself to calm down and then he could address the issue in a peaceful and productive way. He waited sufficient time, and in doing so, he allowed the, the space for the bonds with his children to bend, but not break. And we as believers, we need to create this space for one another as well. Right? Patience gives us the time to calm down, and as we saw in the definition earlier, to avoid premature use of force. 
Now, I just want to call out what it is not. It is not allowing someone to just keep doing wrong by you, to keep attacking you. It is not leaving conflict unresolved. In fact, the Bible gives us the proper way to do that, right? But this type of patience calls us to be slow. It says wait sufficient time. It doesn't say never. It says wait. Because as we saw in the definition earlier, waiting avoids premature use of force that rises out of improper anger. In James 1, 19 to 20, it says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Now, why does James need to call this out, that we should be slow to become angry and that our anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Why does Paul, back in that Ephesian verse, ask us to have this kind of patience, to be slow in expressing anger? It's because as humans, we kind of have a natural tendency to do the opposite, right? To not be slow. Whether that's when we're behind a slow car, whether our children are disobedient, when someone in the church has wronged you, the truth is we're actually hardwired to react when we don't wait sufficient time. Many of you have probably seen this before, but I'll just get this brain graphic up on the screen in a minute. We have different parts of our brains that control us in different ways. And in the most simplest of explanations that I can understand, we have a logical part of our brain and we have an emotional part of our brain. And usually these two parts communicate with each other. But when our emotions are too strong, the emotional part of our brain takes over and we go into automatic mode. For example, if you've got like a hot tea or a hot coffee and you grab the side of that cup and it's like super hot, you don't sit, sit there and think, oh, this is very hot. My hand is burning. It hurts. I wonder how I can stop that from hurting. Oh, maybe I might take my hand off the cup. No, it's automatic, right? You feel it and you move away. Or if you were to go hiking in the American woods and come up against some big bear, you don't suddenly sit there thinking, I wonder what species it is, what color is it? Is it yogi, right? You just go into automatic mode. You go into your fight, flight, or freeze mode. The emotional brain takes over. And when we've been wronged, chances are there could be some pretty strong feelings, some feelings of anger, or betrayal, or the frustration, or the sadness. And if we allow these feelings to control us, we go into automatic mode. When we're in this mode, we actually can't think clearly because the emotional brain's taken over and you can't tap into your logical brain. So it's very unlikely that we're gonna solve the problem in a peaceful and productive way. So the key is to identify when these feelings are getting strong, maybe the heart's racing, maybe the tummy's rumbling, maybe your fists are clenching, maybe your thoughts are spiraling. When we identify it, then we can create space, give yourself sufficient time to be able to tap back into that logical brain. The fight, flight, freeze mode dissipates. We can think rationally. So it makes sense, doesn't it? It makes sense to wait sufficient time. You know, for us, to avoid the premature use of force, and more importantly, to keep our bonds strong. Could you imagine if Jesus immediately turned against Peter when he denied him? I could imagine that being some pretty strong feelings. This has been like your main guy, one of your main guys. He just denies him. I could imagine that being a pretty hurtful time. <laughs> But instead, Jesus allowed space and time for Peter to grow and become who he needed to be. In John 21, soon after Jesus' resurrection, right? Peter's denied Jesus. Jesus has gone to the cross. He's now been resurrected. We actually see Jesus reinstate Peter. He asks him three times, do you love me? And then he says to him to feed his sheep. And he's indicating the role that Peter is going to play to the believers once Jesus is gone. Jesus made space for that bond to bend, but not to break. And in doing so, he allowed Peter the time to grow and become the rock on which the church is built. 
And we need to make space for others to grow too. We need to have the space for our bonds to bend and not break. And we do that through patience, through macrothumia. So I just want to give you two quick points, two quick requirements that are going to help all of us grow in this type of patience. The first point is justice is the Lord's. In Romans 12, 12, it says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. And then in verses 17 to 19, it says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, and I will repay, says the Lord. It is mine to avenge. You may have heard this in the New King James Version, where it says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You know, quite often we're taught to trust God. But maybe you've actually never thought about this as an area for trusting God. Like maybe you've thought, yeah, I'll trust God to provide for me, to guide me to heal me, but maybe you've actually never thought about vengeance as an area of trust in God. But I want to suggest to you today that perhaps this type of patience has more to do with our trust that vengeance is God's, our trust that justice is the Lord's, rather than just our own self-control. For example, when I was growing up, I played a lot of soccer. And up until the age of 17, I played in the mixed comp. Now, they call it mixed comp. There were 16 players in the team. Only two of us were girls. (laughs) But for the most part, the boys in my team, they trusted me that I could hold my own on the ball against any of the other teams, the other boys that we played against. But there were times when we would come up against some just ruthless, brutal thugs. Okay, I did grow up in Bundaberg after all. (laughs) But there were times when I would just be completely taken out, like just wiped out. And in those moments, I didn't feel the need to get up and try and fight some guy that was twice my size because I knew my team had my back. (laughs) And soon enough, whenever I was taken out, that guy, he had a target on him and it was not long until he was wiped out himself. Now, I am not saying that God is gonna wipe out people take them out, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But my point is that in those moments, I didn't feel the need to react hastily because I trusted that someone had my back. And when we have that same trust in God, it helps us to be slow in our response. The truth is God does love you. He's on your team. He's got your back and justice is his. So the first thing we can do to grow in our ability to be patient is to start to pray about our wrongs before we respond to our wrongs. Make it a goal to not respond until you've prayed. Give it to God, trust that he's got our back, justice is his. I'll just get the band up, but my second point to help us grow in our patience is to prioritize the mission over your mission. Prioritize his kingdom over your kingdom. Matthew 6, says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you, right? Generally, when someone's wronged us, we react to defend ourselves, right? To defend our reputation and potentially defend our egos, but we have something even greater that's worth defending, and that is the unity of the spirit of our church. So to do this, we need to prioritize the mission over our mission. For example, if there is a part of the body that is causing sickness and death to the rest of the body, we get rid of it, don't we? Like if there is some serious like gangrene on your big toe and it's going to infect the rest of the body, you don't keep the toe, you cut it off and save the life of the whole body, right? Or if there's cells in your body that have become cancerous, you don't prioritize those cells, you get rid of them and you save the life of the whole body. I think generally, we'd all agree with this when it comes to our own body. 
But I want to pose the question to you today. What about the body of Christ? What about the life of the church? You know, quite often the church is described as the body of Christ and each of us play a part. But no one part should take priority over the health of the body. So when we face opposition or feel like we've been wronged or hurt by someone, keeping a kingdom perspective, placing greater value on the body is gonna help us to be slow in our response. It's our individual ability to show this macrothumia to one another that's going to determine the strength of the bond of peace in our church. So my question to you today is how are you going with patience? Are there people in your life who maybe you've acted too quickly with and in doing so broken instead of bent? Perhaps you've been on the receiving end. I wanna tell you today that even if you feel like you've missed the mark, God is still patient with you and there's still time to grow. Yeah, sure, there might be some bonds that need repairing. We might need to show a bit of humility in that because the truth is we're not always going to get it right. Right? Be in community long enough and you're going to get offended. (laughs) But how you choose to respond to that will determine the strength of that bond. Will you bend instead of break? If we go back to our core scripture, Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble, gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. And then it goes on to talk more about our unity. For us to be this kind of unified church, that's going to allow people to outwork their salvation journey here, for all of us to continue to outwork our salvation journey, which is our ultimate goal, isn't it? To point people to God and to salvation, right? This, this is the calling that we have received that Paul talks about. And I wanna join with Paul this morning and urge all of us to make every effort to keep the unity make every effort, right? It's gonna require a bit of effort from me, from you. Today, we're particularly talking about the effort in patience, right? To have those strong bonds, those bonds of peace. It's gonna require all of us to make an effort to work on our macrothumia, right? I can give you all these reasons that God and Jesus were patient with us and so we should be patient with others, that it makes sense because of how our brain is hardwired, because we wanna be the church where people can outwork their salvation. But ultimately it comes up to you and to me committing to practicing macrothumia. We're all in this together, but it takes each of us individually to commit to it, to create this flexibility in our bonds by waiting sufficient time before expressing anger. And to help us do that, it's a trust exercise with God. He's got you back. We need to prioritize the mission. Church, I pray that you've received this message how you've needed to this morning. I trust that God has met you where you're at and I pray that it's going to bless your life. But more than that, I pray it's gonna bless us as a church, as we outwork this together. I just wanna pray with you if you'd bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, we just thank you that you were first patient with us. Father, we thank you that we can be a part of community in outworking our faith journey. And Lord, we want to be the church that lives worthy of the calling that you've called us to, Father. Lord, thank you for your word. And we just pray, help us. Help us as we commit to growing in macrothumia, in Jesus' name. And while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you're here this morning and you've never given your life to God, I just want to remind you again, God's patient with you. The Bible says that he knocks 
at the door of your heart and he waits. He waits for you to open the door. And if you're here this morning, I want to suggest God's knocking. He's just waiting for you to let him into your life. And I want to give you the opportunity to do that today. I want to give you the opportunity to invite God into your life to receive the salvation that we've been talking about this morning, which is all about eternity with God in heaven. I want to pray with you if that's you this morning. So while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, if you've never given your life to God, but this morning you feel him knocking and you're ready to invite him in, can I just ask you in faith to raise your hand? When we raise our hand, it requires something of us. It says, yep, I'm gonna reach out to God. If you're here this morning, you've never given your life to God and you'd like to this morning, can you just raise your hand? Thank you, Father. God, we just thank you again that you're patient with us. Father, we invite you into our life. We just thank you, Lord, that you continue with us on this journey of faith, of salvation, and for us to continue to grow in this bond of peace, Lord. Father, we love you. We give you all praise and glory, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. I pray that it's blessed you. I'll hand back to Pastor Russell. Yeah.